Hey folks, I know I am just an old guy telling stories, but please leave a like and subscribe before we start. Let's enjoy in today's stories. Before I dive into today's stories, I want to say, disclaimer, the content presented in the video is purely for entertainment purposes only. The theories and stories discussed in this video are speculative and are not supported by any evidence or proof. Viewer discretion is advised. I've always had a fascination with secrets. Not the kind you gossip about with your friends, but the kind that go way beyond what we know. Hidden knowledge that changes how we see the world. You could say I've spent way too many late nights reading about government conspiracies, lost civilizations, and especially the strange and almost mystical inventions of Nikola Tesla. He's always been the figure that sticks out to me. A man whose ideas seem to defy his era. There's this theory that some of Tesla's most revolutionary work was hidden away, locked up in vaults far from the public eye. I wanted to find out if that was true. I'll admit, what I decided to do next was probably the dumbest thing I've ever done. But curiosity has a way of making you do things you wouldn't normally consider. After months of digging through the deep web, I found a forum where people claimed they could hire hackers for, well, let's just say non-traditional tasks. It felt like a line I shouldn't cross, but I couldn't help myself. I created a new account, masking my IP, using every trick I could find to stay anonymous. I posted a request. Looking for an experienced hacker will pay well for a job involving highly classified government files, specifically on Tesla's inventions and records of ancient technologies that could change the course of history. DM for details. I half expected to get no responses or maybe just some trolls pretending to be serious. But within a few hours I received a message. The user had no profile picture, no posts, no comments, just a name made up of random characters. It was unsettling but the message was simple and to the point, I can get you what you're looking for. Payment, $5,000 in Bitcoin, no negotiations. I'll have everything in 72 hours. $5,000 wasn't small change for me, but the promise of what I might learn was too tempting. After a bit of back and forth, we settled on terms, and I made the payment through a secure crypto wallet. They asked for my email, a burner one that I created for this purpose. For a while, I thought the whole thing might be a scam, that I'd just thrown my money into the digital ether. But surprisingly, the hacker stayed true to their word. Almost exactly 72 hours later, I received a message. Check your email. Don't share this with anyone. When I opened the file, it wasn't what I expected. It was a compressed folder, heavily encrypted. The hacker had sent me a code to decrypt it, along with a warning. What you're about to see is beyond what you think you know. Be careful. I couldn't tell if it was a genuine caution or just a scare tactic. But either way, I felt a strange heaviness as I typed in the code and opened the folder. Inside, there were dozens of documents, PDFs, scanned papers, and even some audio recordings. But one file stood out, labeled simply, Tesla Prototypes 1938. The documents were old, the scans grainy, as if they'd been hastily copied from originals that were never meant to see the light of day. The first page was a memo, dated 1943, the same year Tesla died. It mentioned a meeting between several high-ranking officials and a few scientists whose names I didn't recognize. They discussed confiscating all relevant materials from Tesla's New York apartment, claiming it was a matter of national security. And that's when things got weird. The next few pages contained blueprints, but not like any I'd seen before. They were hand-drawn, featuring intricate details of machines that I couldn't even begin to understand. One looked like some kind of energy weapon, Another resembled a device for long-distance communication, but not through radio waves. Something different. There were notes in Tesla's handwriting, equations scribbled in the margins that referenced concepts I'd only seen in fringe physics forums. But the most chilling part was the letter attached at the end of the file. It was from a government official, sent to a scientist, urging them to bury the prototypes in research, to never let it surface. The letter read, the implications of this technology are too dangerous. The public is not ready. 
it is essential that the project remains dormant indefinitely. Failure to comply will be met with the utmost consequences. It almost felt like I had stumbled upon a hidden chapter of history that had been intentionally erased. And as I went through more documents, I found similar references to other bizarre projects, ones involving ancient ruins in remote parts of the world, machinery that could bend the fabric of reality and devices that were eerily similar to the concepts of modern quantum computers, except they were designed almost a century ago. I couldn't believe what I was reading. If any of this was real, it meant that the world I thought I understood was just a carefully curated version of the truth, and that somewhere out there, a vault full of technologies beyond our wildest imagination might actually exist. But at that moment, all I could do was sit in my dark room staring at the screen, wondering what exactly I had just gotten myself into. I didn't know where to go from here, whether I should dig deeper, or if I should just shut it all down and forget I ever tried to uncover any of this. Yet something inside me refused to let go. I needed to know more. I needed to see just how far this rabbit hole went. Little did I realize then that the most disturbing secrets were yet to come. After spending hours combing through the initial files, I realized that these documents were only the tip of the iceberg. The folder included subdirectories labeled with code names like Project Echo, T Fields, and Nikola Tesla anomalies. Most of these didn't make much sense at first, just cryptic references and redacted passages that hinted at experiments conducted in remote labs and underground facilities. But the further I dug, the more it became clear that these projects had been far from ordinary. One of the files, Project Echo, detailed something that caught my attention immediately. It spoke about a technology that Tesla allegedly developed to communicate across dimensions. It described a machine capable of generating electromagnetic fields that could tune into different planes of existence, places where time didn't follow the same rules as ours. According to the notes, Tesla believed that this device could make contact with higher intelligences or even glimpses of what he called the timeless realms. A particular page from 1936 was labeled Test Incident, Nevada. It recounted a series of experiments in a desert area, far from any populated place, where the machine supposedly managed to create a temporal window, a way to see into a reality where the world looked familiar, but was fundamentally different. The description was sparse, as if the author had been deliberately vague, but the tone was serious, scientific, like it wasn't written for entertainment, but for a restricted audience that already knew more than they should. The report also mentioned something unsettling, a brief note that read, test concluded after unexplained phenomena detected, advised to discontinue further trials. It made me wonder what they might have seen through that window. Was it another world entirely, or maybe just another version of our own, slightly shifted? My imagination ran wild with possibilities, but I tried not to dwell on it. I wasn't interested in wild theories, I wanted something tangible, something I could trace back to real events. I moved on to another folder, this one titled Tea Fields. Inside were pages of complex schematics and formulae that I couldn't make heads or tails of, but I did find some handwritten notes from Tesla himself. They described his work on creating a field of energy that could manipulate gravity, even suggesting that he had succeeded in creating a small-scale anti-gravity device. It sounded absurd like something out of a science fiction novel, yet here it was in his unmistakable handwriting. The notes were littered with phrases like field stabilization issues and excess energy bleed off, suggesting that he'd encountered significant challenges but believed he was close to a breakthrough before everything abruptly stopped. But the most intriguing part of the tea fields folder was a document that appeared to be a transcript of a meeting between Tesla and a group of government agents. It was dated only months before his death, and it hinted at a confrontation of sorts, Tesla demanding recognition and release of his findings, while the officials insisted that the technology posed too great a risk. At one point, Tesla's words were recorded as saying, you're not prepared for the future this will bring. 
but it is coming, with or without your consent. It left me with more questions than answers. Why would the government be so keen on hiding technologies like these? Was it because they couldn't control them, or because they could change everything about the way we live? There was no way to know for sure, but I kept going deeper into the files, hoping that somewhere I'd find something that would piece it all together. Among the final batch of files, I discovered something unexpected. An old, grainy photograph, apparently scanned from a much older original. It showed Tesla standing beside a strange contraption, a metal frame with coils and wires running around its edges, large enough to fit a person inside. Tesla was holding what looked like a control panel with wires trailing off into the machine. On the back of the photograph, someone had written in faint pencil, Device 7, Philadelphia, 1938. I cross-referenced the date with some of the other notes in the folder, and there it was again. The same references to Device 7 and tests conducted outside Philadelphia. If my interpretation was right, this machine was part of a larger effort that had been shut down just before the war began. The details were limited, but a few of the notes hinted at distortions and unexpected results. It sounded like the kind of thing that would have made headlines if anyone outside those circles had known about it. By the time I reached the end of the files, my mind was buzzing with possibilities. If any of this was even remotely true, it meant that Tesla's work had gone far beyond what anyone had ever imagined. But it also meant that these technologies had been hidden away for decades under the lock and key of those who decided the public wasn't ready. After hours of reading and taking notes, I finally closed my laptop. I realized it was way past midnight and my room was eerily silent. I sat there for a moment, trying to process everything. I thought about how close I might be to uncovering something that could change how we see the world. But a small part of me couldn't shake the unease. The realization that if all this had been buried for so long, maybe there was a reason for it. Yet, despite everything, I wasn't ready to stop. I needed more answers, and I wasn't about to give up now. After my deep dive into the initial files, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had only scratched the surface. The more I read, the more I realized that this wasn't just about secret government projects or buried technologies. It was about a vision of the world that had been deliberately hidden. I needed to dig deeper into this puzzle to piece together what exactly Tesla had been working on and why it had been hidden away. But I also knew I needed to be careful with how much I exposed myself, so I took extra steps to keep my digital footprint hidden, even if it felt a bit paranoid. I focused on one document I hadn't fully explored yet. It was titled, Nikola Tesla, Anomalies, to 1939, and seemed to be a collection of eyewitness accounts, test logs, and what appeared to be personal letters from people who had interacted with Tesla during the later years of his life. Most of these were from individuals who worked in obscurity, scientists, engineers, and even a few high-ranking military officials. One of the logs described an incident that occurred during a demonstration of one of Tesla's devices. According to the notes, Tesla had set up a machine that could project what he called synchronized oscillations. The demonstration took place in a secure lab with a few trusted witnesses. The records described how the device emitted a low hum that seemed to resonate through the entire building, making objects subtly vibrate like they were being drawn towards an invisible source. But then something happened. The notes became more disjointed, as if the person recording them had trouble putting the experience into words. It described how the device suddenly surged in power, causing nearby electrical equipment to malfunction and lights to flicker. Then came a phrase that stuck out. Localized time dilation observed. Duration of three minutes unaccounted for by all present. I read that line over and over trying to make sense of it. If this account was genuine, it meant that Tesla had somehow manipulated time itself, even if just in a localized area. The document ended abruptly with a directive to cease all further tests and relocate the device to a secure storage facility. There was no mention of where that facility might be, 
but I had a hunch that it was somewhere far off the grid. This was the first time I truly wondered whether Tesla's ideas went beyond the realm of science and into something more. Strange, like he'd brushed up against the edge of what was possible. But as much as these notes fascinated me, they didn't give me any leads on where these devices might have ended up. I needed something concrete, a name or a place that I could trace. That's when I found a letter from a military officer stationed at a base in Alaska. The letter was dated 1945 and was addressed to a superior officer, discussing a series of unusual shipments that had arrived under strict secrecy. The cargo, described as sensitive technological equipment, had been stored in an underground facility designated only as Site-22. The officer mentioned that the equipment included Tesla's Device 7 and several crates marked with the insignia of a project I hadn't seen before. Operation Black Star. I started cross-referencing Operation Black Star with other documents and stumbled upon another memo. This one was a directive to all personnel involved with the project, instructing them to keep any knowledge of the site completely classified, even from other branches of the military. It seemed like a dead end until I noticed a faint stamp in the corner, partially obscured but readable. Groom Lake. The name clicked instantly. I knew Groom Lake was better known as Area 51, the infamous testing site for experimental aircraft. But this memo was from 1945, years before the site would become public knowledge. If Tesla's inventions had been taken there, then it meant they'd been hidden away long before the world even knew such a place existed. The implications were staggering. Had Tesla's work become part of the foundation for the secret research that the base would later become notorious for? It felt like I was chasing shadows, piecing together fragments of a history that was never meant to be known. But at least now I had a potential location. I couldn't exactly drive out to a military base and demand to see what was inside, but it did make me wonder if there were old employees, former engineers, or contractors who might have left records. If Tesla's devices truly were locked away somewhere out there, maybe someone knew a little more than they should have. The more I read, the more it became clear that this wasn't just about hiding dangerous technology. It was about controlling the narrative of what's possible. It was as if someone had decided that humanity wasn't ready for the kind of advancements Tesla envisioned and they'd done everything they could to suppress that knowledge, locking it away in remote corners of the country. By the time I finished combing through the last of the documents, my brain felt overloaded with a whirlwind of details and theories. But I knew I couldn't stop now. I decided to take the next step, researching old newspaper clippings and public records that might connect Tesla to the early days of Area 51 or any of the individuals mentioned in the files. I spent the next few nights searching through online archives, piecing together mentions of Tesla's later years with vague hints of secret government projects. I managed to find a few obscure articles from the 1950s about mysterious scientific research being conducted in the Nevada desert, always vague, always hinting at something more. One article mentioned a discreet scientific symposium that took place just outside Las Vegas, where a group of scientists gathered to discuss technologies that never made it into the mainstream. Among the attendees was a name I recognized from the documents, Dr. Henry Calver, one of the engineers who had supposedly worked with Tesla in his final years. The article didn't go into much detail, but it did mention that Calver had a background in electrical physics and work with experimental energy devices. That was the link I needed, a real person I could research further, someone who might have left behind more traces. For the first time since I'd started this strange journey, I felt like I was on the verge of uncovering something real. I just had to keep following the trail, hoping it would lead me to answers rather than more questions. With a new lead in hand, I shifted my focus to Dr. Henry Calver, the engineer who seemed to be a key figure in Tesla's final experiments. Most of the information about him was buried deep in old academic journals and obscure scientific publications. It took a few days of searching, 
but I eventually found a reference to an interview he gave in the early 1960s, published in a small, now-defunct magazine dedicated to experimental science. The interview hinted at his involvement in unconventional energy research, though it was clear he had chosen his words carefully. I managed to find a scanned copy of the interview through a niche online archive. The quality of the scan wasn't great. Cracked pages, faded ink. But the words were there, preserved just enough to read. Calver talked about his early days in electrical engineering, touching on the challenges of working with theories that many of his peers dismissed as outlandish. But there was one part that caught my attention immediately. Some of us had the privilege of working alongside a man whose ideas could have shaped a new world, Nikola Tesla. What we saw, what we discovered, it would change how we understood energy forever, but the world wasn't ready or so we were told. The only thing I can say is that there are places out there where such discoveries have been buried, waiting for a time when we might be able to handle their implications. It was the closest thing I'd found to a direct acknowledgement that Tesla's research had been intentionally hidden away. The interviewer pressed him for more details, but Calver evaded the questions, redirecting the conversation back to mundane topics. He seemed to know he was treading dangerous ground. The rest of the interview was mostly fluff, but there was one other piece that stood out, a passing mention of a remote consultation Calver had conducted in the late 1940s. He described visiting a facility in New Mexico where he was asked to inspect an unidentified piece of equipment that seemed to operate on principles he had only seen in Tesla's notes. He never explicitly named the facility, but he described it as being in a barren, isolated location. The interviewer didn't pursue the detail further, but I had a hunch this consultation had something to do with the projects I'd read about in the encrypted files. This was my next lead. I scoured more local records, hoping to find any reference to Calver's trip to New Mexico. Most of what I found was dead ends, but eventually, I came across an old travel log archived from the New Mexico Historical Society. It listed various visitors to a restricted site near Los Alamos, including several names that matched those I had seen in the documents. And there, buried among the entries, was Calver's name, alongside a date, March 1949. I couldn't believe my luck. The logs didn't specify what the purpose of the visit was, but it confirmed that Calver had indeed been called to some kind of secret facility after World War II. That meant that Tesla's research hadn't been buried immediately after his death. It had been kept alive, at least for a few more years before disappearing into classified archives. But why New Mexico? I spent the next few days digging through declassified files and public archives trying to figure out what might have been going on in the area during that time. Most of the records focused on atomic research, but one caught my eye. It was a heavily redacted report about a series of energy anomalies detected near a testing range outside Los Alamos, around the same time as Calver's visit. The report was vague, with large sections blacked out, but it mentioned unusual electromagnetic activity that couldn't be attributed to standard testing procedures. I started to think that whatever Tesla had been working on, whatever devices he left behind, might have been tested there, in the deserts of New Mexico, before being locked away for good. Maybe they had tried to understand it, to harness the technology, but found it too unpredictable, too different from anything they'd encountered before. The idea that these experiments might have left traces even decades later was thrilling. It meant that there could be more to find, more pieces of this strange puzzle that had yet to be uncovered. I wanted to know if there was anyone still alive who might remember those tests. Perhaps an old technician or security guard who had seen something they shouldn't have. After some more digging, I found a name that kept popping up in the context of the area. Robert Harlow a retired engineer who had once worked on classified projects near Los Alamos. Most of what I found about him was mundane, just mentions of community events and volunteer work, but I eventually tracked down a local newsletter that included an interview with him talking about his time as a young engineer. I decided to take a chance and reached out, sending him a carefully worded email, 
I mentioned my interest in historical research about Tesla and some of the more obscure technological developments of the 20th century. To my surprise, he responded a few days later, agreeing to meet me at a diner near his home. He said he didn't know much but was curious why someone like me would be interested in such old stories. When I arrived at the diner, I didn't know what to expect. Maybe an eccentric old man with a penchant for exaggeration. But Robert was surprisingly sharp for his age, with a calm, steady way of speaking that made it clear he wasn't one for tall tales. He sipped his coffee and listened as I explained my interest in Tesla and the mysteries surrounding his later years. At first he seemed cautious, perhaps even a bit amused by my questions, but when I mentioned Calver's visit in 1949, his expression changed. He leaned in slightly, his voice lowering as if he wanted to keep our conversation private despite the empty booth around us. Calver, he mused, tapping his fingers on the table. Now that's a name I haven't heard in a long time. Funny you mention him. We brought him out to look at something, though I never got the full story myself. They told us it was just another sensor test, but I knew better than to ask too many questions back then. I pressed him for more details and he hesitated, as if weighing the risks of saying too much. Finally, he sighed and shook his head. Look, all I know is that whatever Calver was involved with, it wasn't just about sensors. They had him looking at some kind of equipment that didn't match anything I'd seen before. Strange machines that ran without any visible power source. Things that made our own tech look like children's toys. They took him into the lower levels, where only a handful of us were allowed, and whatever he saw down there, he wasn't the same when he came back out. Robert didn't elaborate further, but it was clear that even after all these years, he hadn't forgotten whatever strange work had taken place beneath the desert. He wouldn't say more, but he did give me a tip, a place where he thought old records might still exist, in a dusty archive maintained by a local historical society that few people visited anymore. As I left the diner, my mind was buzzing with possibilities. It felt like I was on the verge of finding something concrete, a real piece of history that might prove everything I had read about in those files but I knew I had to tread carefully. I wasn't dealing with ordinary mysteries anymore. I was on the edge of uncovering secrets that had been buried for decades. Secrets that were never meant to be found. Armed with Robert's tip, I headed out to the old Historical Society archive in New Mexico. It was housed in a small, nondescript building on the outskirts of town, the kind of place that looked more like an antique store than a repository of secrets. When I walked in, I was greeted by the musty scent of old paper and a kind elderly volunteer who seemed surprised that anyone would be interested in the archive. I told her I was doing some research on mid-century scientific projects, and she directed me to a back room where records from the 1940s and 1950s were kept. Most of the boxes were filled with mundane government records, local census data, and dusty newspapers. But after a few hours of digging, I found a small, unassuming file that caught my eye. It was labeled Site 22, Restricted Personnel. Inside was a list of names, engineers, scientists, military officers, all of them connected to the projects I had read about in the encrypted files. And there, near the top of the list, was Dr. Henry Calver, along with a handful of other names I recognized from my research. The file didn't offer any technical details, but it did include a reference number for an old personnel report stored in a locked cabinet across the room. With the help of the volunteer, I got access to the report. It was written in the stilted, formal language of military documents, but it painted a picture of what had happened at Site-22. It described how, in early 2022, a series of events occurred at Site-22-1949. A team of scientists, including Calver, had been brought in to inspect a device of unknown origin that had been relocated from a classified site in Nevada. The report detailed how the device exhibited anomalous energy readings and how their attempts to power it up had led to unexplained disruptions in nearby electrical systems. But there was more. 
Tucked into the back of the file was a handwritten note, almost an afterthought, by one of the engineers who had been there. I don't know what that thing was, but it sure wasn't built by us. Calver said it reminded him of something Tesla showed him once, but he wouldn't say what. They shut the whole project down when the readings got too high. Said we were risking a repeat of what happened in Nevada. Whatever that means. It was exactly what I had been looking for. A direct connection between Tesla's work and these secret experiments. And more importantly, a hint that Tesla's Device 7 might still exist, hidden somewhere beneath the desert sands. The documents didn't say where it had been moved, but they suggested that the experiments were stopped not because they didn't work, but because they worked too well, because they were tapping into something that nobody fully understood. As I drove back from the archive, I thought about everything I had uncovered. The idea that Tesla had developed technologies far beyond his time, and that those inventions had been buried for decades, wasn't just a theory anymore. It was practically a certainty. And while I still didn't know exactly what those devices were capable of, it was clear that the people in charge had decided that they were too dangerous to share with the world. Part of me wanted to keep digging, to find out if those devices still existed, hidden away in some forgotten facility or locked inside a vault deep beneath the ground. But another part of me knew that I had reached a natural stopping point. I had seen the shadows of a hidden history, and even if I never got to see the full picture, I had found enough to know that the world was far stranger than I had ever imagined. In the weeks that followed, I tried to share my findings with a few online communities, but most people dismissed it as another conspiracy theory. They didn't know about the encrypted files or the old records I had found, and I wasn't about to put myself at risk by uploading those documents for everyone to see. I kept them to myself, stored safely on a drive that never touched the internet. As the days passed, I felt a strange sense of satisfaction, even though my curiosity still burned. I had come face to face with a mystery that had been buried for nearly a century. And while I might never know all the answers, I felt like I had uncovered something important, something that connected me to a hidden part of history. I still think about it sometimes, about the technology Tesla created and the strange machines that had been hidden away from the public eye. I wonder if the world will ever be ready for them, or if they'll remain buried, forgotten in the pages of history and the sand of the Nevada desert. And though I've moved on with my life, there's a part of me that knows that somewhere out there, in some dusty old storage room or sealed underground bunker, those secrets are still waiting, waiting for the day when someone else is bold enough to seek them out. And maybe, just maybe, that day will come sooner than we think. In the world of amateur astronomy, nothing excites me more than uncharted territories and unexplained phenomena. My nights were typically spent on the roof of our family's old creaky house, with my trusty telescope pointing toward the starlit sky. It was a serene escape from my day-to-day -day life as a software developer, where the most excitement I had was finding a missing semicolon in lines of code. One chilly September evening, as I was browsing through online forums dedicated to celestial events, I stumbled upon a peculiar thread. The post was cryptic, mentioning a set of coordinates and a timestamp with no further explanation. Driven by curiosity and the thrill of a potential discovery, I decided to log the coordinates into my telescope's automated tracking system. That night, I observed nothing out of the ordinary, but the seed of intrigue was planted. Days passed, and the thread continued to gnaw at me. There was something unsettling about the stark minimalism of the post. I returned to the forum, but the thread had vanished without a trace. It was as if someone had scrubbed it clean from the internet. This piqued my interest even more, and I began searching for similar anomalies reported by other sky watchers. My quest led me to a series of obscure documents on the dark web, Navigating through this uncharted part of the internet was like wading through a swamp. Every step had to be taken with utmost caution. After hours of digging and avoiding suspicious links, I found a document titled The Observation of Celestial Body, 3922, Restricted Access. 
The document was a bizarre mix of technical jargon and carefully worded directives. It detailed observations of a celestial body that was only visible from certain parts of the Earth, under very specific conditions. According to the document, this body had been observed sporadically since the late 1950s, but was kept out of public knowledge and academic circles. The reasons for this were unclear, but the document mentioned psychological effects and behavioral changes in individuals who had observed it. What was even more disturbing was the mention of a small town, not too far from where I lived, that had been the site of a series of unexplained disappearances over the past few decades. The dates of these disappearances loosely correlated with the supposed appearances of this celestial body. Armed with this information, I decided to undertake a journey to this town. My intention wasn't just to observe the second moon, but also to understand its impact on the townsfolk. The drive was long, and the landscape gradually shifted from the urban sprawl to lush greenery, and then to the unkempt roads of the rural outskirts. The town was quaint, an almost picturesque representation of rural America, but with an air of desolation hanging over it. As I settled into the small bed and breakfast that would be my base of operations, I prepared my equipment and reviewed my notes. Tonight would be the first night I would attempt to observe Celestial Body 3922 from the coordinates provided in the dark web document. The sun set and darkness enveloped the town. The stars began to peek through the veil of twilight and I set up my telescope in the backyard of the B&B, &B, which offered an unobstructed view of the northern sky. The anticipation was palpable as I adjusted the lenses and aligned the scope with the coordinates. What I didn't expect was how ordinary the night would seem. Crickets chirped in the grass, a cool breeze rustled the leaves, and the town remained eerily silent, as if holding its breath. As the clock neared the specified time, I kept my eye glued to the eyepiece, my hand ready to adjust the focus at a moment's notice. And then, as the digital clock display on my phone flipped to the appointed time, I saw it, an additional speck of light faint but distinctly present where no star should have been. It wasn't on any star map I owned. It was as if I was looking at a ghost of a moon, a phantom that wasn't supposed to exist. The revelation was exhilarating yet deeply unsettling. What was this second moon and why was it hidden from us? As the night progressed, I documented everything meticulously, knowing that what I was observing was meant to stay a secret. Yet here I was, a lone witness to a celestial conspiracy of silent moons and hidden truths. The implications were enormous, not just astronomically, but also for the fabric of our understanding of the universe. As I packed up for the night, the moon, the real one we all knew and were comforted by, hung low in the sky, almost as if it were watching me. I couldn't help but wonder if the truth was something we were ever meant to confront. The following morning was cloaked in a blanket of fog, a silent guardian of the town's secrets. As I sipped my coffee at the small table of the B&B, &B, I mulled over the sightings from the previous night. The mysterious celestial body I had observed was both fascinating and foreboding. It begged the question, why would such a discovery need to be kept secret? My thoughts were interrupted by the cheerful chime of the B&B's old-fashioned bell as a new guest checked in. The town might have seemed empty, but it was clear that others were drawn here, perhaps some by curiosity as strong as mine. I spent the day visiting the town's library, a small but well-kept building that seemed to hold more than just books. The librarian, an elderly woman with an inquisitive gaze, noticed my interest in local history. She pointed me towards a collection of old newspapers and photo albums that documented the town through the decades. Flipping through the pages, I found numerous subtle references to peculiar nights where the townsfolk reported seeing strange lights or experiencing unexplained insomnia. None of these accounts were explicit, but they painted a picture of a community repeatedly brushed by the unknown. With nightfall approaching, I planned my second observation session. This time, my goal was not just to confirm the existence of the second moon, but to capture photographic evidence. I had brought a high-resolution camera capable of long exposure shots, perfect for celestial photography. As darkness reclaimed the sky, 
I set up my equipment with practiced precision, my fingers adeptly adjusting the settings even in the low light. The night was eerily still, the earlier fog having lifted, leaving behind a clarity in the air that seemed almost palpable. At the designated time, I began my long exposure capture. The minutes ticked by slowly, each second a stretch of anticipation. When I finally checked the camera's display, my breath caught. There, amidst the familiar constellations, was a faint trace of something else, something that official charts would deny. The image showed a pale, elusive orb, its presence an enigma wrapped in the night sky's embrace. But it was the next sequence of photos that deepened the mystery. As I adjusted the telescope slightly northward, following a hunch, I captured a series of shots that showed the second moon moving, or so it seemed. Its trajectory was unlike anything I'd known in conventional astronomy. This moon followed an erratic path, disappearing and reappearing as if playing a cosmic game of hide-and-seek. Intrigued and somewhat unnerved, I returned to my notes, sketching diagrams and jotting down times. The behavior of this celestial body defied the predictable movements of known astronomical objects. Was it possible that this second moon was not a natural body, but something else? Something orchestrated or controlled? The implications were staggering. The existence of such an anomaly could upend our understanding of the cosmos. It could suggest the presence of technology far beyond our current capabilities, or perhaps a natural phenomenon yet to be explained by modern science. That night, as I packed away my equipment, I felt a profound sense of responsibility. I had come in search of answers, but each discovery only led to more questions. What was the purpose of hiding this second moon? What effects did it truly have on people? The town slept quietly around me, unaware or indifferent to the celestial dance overhead. I knew I needed to learn more, to observe more. The next step was clear. I would need to delve deeper into the town's history, perhaps speak to longtime residents who might unwittingly hold pieces of this cosmic puzzle. As I lay in bed, the moonlight filtering through the curtains, I realized that my journey was only just beginning. Whatever secrets lay buried in this quaint town, I was determined to uncover them, armed with nothing but my telescope and an insatiable need to know the truth. As the sun rose over the sleepy town, painting the sky with streaks of orange and pink, I was already up and preparing for a day of deeper investigation. The mysteries of the second moon and its erratic behavior had consumed my thoughts, and I was determined to glean more information from the town's residents. With the town slowly waking, I decided to visit the local diner, a hub of activity where I hoped to casually strike up conversations with some of the older residents. The diner, with its checkered floor and retro jukebox, was like stepping back in time. I ordered a coffee and took a seat near the counter where I could easily overhear and engage with the locals. An elderly man named Harold, with a face as weathered as the town's old dock, soon took the stool next to mine. We struck up a conversation about the town's history after I mentioned being in town for a bit of historical research. Harold, eager to share stories of his youth, proved to be a wellspring of local lore. It's not the same anymore, you know. This town used to be bustling, full of life, Harold began, his voice tinged with nostalgia. But ever since those strange nights started happening more frequently, people just started moving away. Strange nights? I probed gently, not wanting to reveal too much of my own interests. Oh, you know, nights where the whole sky seemed different. Folks said they felt uneasy, like something was off but couldn't quite put their finger on it, he explained, stirring his coffee slowly. Harold's accounts matched the snippets I had seen in the old newspapers. As he spoke, I scribbled down notes, disguising them as doodles in my sketchbook. He mentioned specific dates and events, like the local festival that was inexplicably canceled one year after several attendees reported feeling disoriented. The morning passed, and with each story Harold shared, the puzzle pieces began to fit together, forming a picture of a town touched by an unexplained cosmic anomaly. 
It wasn't just about sightings of a second moon, it was the effect it had on the town. Subtle, yet profound. Armed with new dates and details, I returned to the B&B &B to plot these against the astronomical data I had gathered. There seemed to be a correlation between the appearances of the second moon and these strange nights Harold described. For my next observation, I decided to focus not just on the sky, but on the town itself. As dusk fell, I set up my equipment on a small hill overlooking the town. From here, I could observe both the heavens and the subtle reactions of the town below. That night, as I watched through my telescope, the second moon appeared again, faint and elusive. But this time I noticed something else, a faint glow emanating from the forest just on the edge of town. It was not the natural luminescence of fireflies or the distant lights of a car, but something different, something quieter. Curiosity won over caution, and I packed up my gear, heading towards the forest with a flashlight in hand. The woods were silent, the noise of the town, a distant murmur. As I moved closer to the source of the light, the air grew inexplicably colder. Finally, in a clearing, I found it, a small, unassuming monument that I had not noticed during my daytime explorations. It was an old stone pedestal with a metallic plaque, worn by time. The engraving was hard to read, but I could just make out the words in memory of those lost to the night. Chilled by the implication, yet undeterred, I recorded the location and decided it was time to delve even deeper. The next day would be spent in the town archives, searching for any records of this monument and the people it commemorated. There was a story here, woven into the very fabric of the town, and I was closer than ever to unraveling it. The truth was hidden just beneath the surface, waiting to be uncovered. The following morning, under a sky that seemed unnaturally clear, I made my way to the town archives. The building was tucked away behind the local museum, its exterior walls covered in ivy that whispered secrets of the past. Inside, the air was thick with the scent of old paper and forgotten tales. The archivist, a middle-aged woman named Mrs. Elwood, greeted me with a smile that was both welcoming and wary. I'm researching the town's history, particularly events that aren't well documented, I explained, keeping my inquiry vague to avoid raising suspicion. Mrs. Elwood nodded, her eyes flickering with a spark of curiosity. We have many old records and newspapers. If it happened in this town, it's probably in here somewhere she said, leading me to a series of dusty shelves filled with leather-bound books and yellowing documents. I spent hours poring over the archives, my fingers delicately turning pages filled with birth records, property deeds, and council minutes. It was in the minutes of a town meeting dated back to 1962 that I found the first mention of the monument in the forest. The text was cryptic discussing a decision to erect a memorial for those affected by the celestial anomaly. There was no further explanation, but it was a tangible connection to the whispered stories and the second moon. My research was interrupted by a gentle tap on my shoulder. Mrs. Elwood stood there, holding a small dusty book that looked like it hadn't been touched in decades. I overheard you asking about unusual events. This might help, she said, handing me the book. The book was a personal journal belonging to a former mayor of the town, who had served during the time of the monument's erection. His entries were meticulous, detailing his daily duties and the challenges the town faced. As I flipped through the pages, the mayor's words grew increasingly troubled, particularly around the time the monument was built. People are uneasy, reporting lights in the sky and a feeling of dread that washes over the town at night. One entry read, we decided to put up the monument as a form of closure to help the town move past the fear. Armed with new information, I decided it was time to confront the phenomenon directly. That evening, I set out once again to the clearing in the forest, this time with a new sense of purpose. I needed to observe the second moon from this specific location, perhaps to witness what those before me had seen. 
As the sun set, casting long shadows over the ground, I set up my telescope near the monument. The forest around me felt alive, each rustle of the leaves and distant animal cry adding to the night's symphony. And then, as darkness settled fully over the land, it appeared, more clearly than ever before. The second moon was visible, not just as a faint glow, but as a distinct, shimmering orb. This time I did more than just observe. I felt a deep, unexplainable connection to the phenomenon. It was as though the second moon's light was revealing not just itself, but also a part of the town's soul. The night air felt charged with energy, and the usual sounds of the forest seemed to quiet, as if in reverence. The second moon's light grew brighter, illuminating the clearing and the monument with an ethereal glow. I took several photos, capturing the moment with a clarity that sent a shiver of awe through me. Not of fear, but of revelation. Here was proof of something extraordinary, something that connected all of us through the mysterious tapestry of the cosmos. As I packed up my equipment, the light from the second moon seemed to pulse gently, like a heartbeat in the sky. I knew then that my journey was not just about uncovering hidden truths, but about understanding how those truths shaped the lives of those who came before me, and how they would influence those who came after. My next steps were clear. I needed to share these discoveries to bring to light the story of the second moon and its impact on this small town. The truth, I realized, had the power to change everything. The final night of my stay in the town arrived with a quiet anticipation. As I prepared for one last observation session, my mind replayed the extraordinary events of the past few days. The connections I had made, both celestial and earthly, had woven a rich tapestry that told a story far greater than I had initially imagined. Armed with my findings and the photographs I had taken, I knew it was time to share this discovery. The implications were too significant to keep hidden, and the truth about the second moon needed to be known, not just by the scientific community, but by the public as well. Before leaving the town, I arranged a meeting with the local historical society and presented my research, including the journal entries from the former mayor and the photographs of the second moon. The members of the society listened intently, their faces a mixture of skepticism and intrigue. This could change everything we know about our town, and perhaps even our place in the universe, one of the older members said, his voice trembling slightly with the weight of the revelation. I proposed an initiative to create an educational program based on the second moon, aimed at bringing tourists and astronomy enthusiasts to the town. By embracing its unique history and celestial phenomenon, the town could foster a new identity that celebrated its mysteries rather than feared them. The society agreed to help, and plans were set into motion to update the local museum with a section dedicated to the second moon. I left them with copies of all my documentation and a network of contacts from universities and astronomical societies that might aid in further research. On my drive back home, the landscape seemed to echo my thoughts. Open fields stretching towards horizons filled with potential. I felt a profound connection to the universe, a sense of unity that went beyond the stars and skies. Once home, I compiled my research into a comprehensive report and submitted it to a well-known astronomical journal. I also started a blog to document the second moon and its effects, sharing not just the scientific observations but also the personal stories of the town's residents. The blog quickly gained traction, sparking discussions and theories about the nature of our universe. Social media buzzed with the news of the second moon, and soon, the story was picked up by mainstream media. Interviews, documentaries, and even a feature article in a major science magazine followed. The town became a focal point for those curious about the night sky, transforming it from a place shrouded in mystery to one illuminated by discovery. As I watched the town evolve from afar, I received messages from people around the world who had similar stories, hidden phenomena, and unexplained celestial events. 
It seemed that by shedding light on one secret, I had opened a doorway to countless others, each beckoning for exploration and understanding. Reflecting on my journey, I realized that the true legacy of my discovery was not just the unveiling of a hidden celestial body, but the illumination of human curiosity and our perpetual quest for knowledge. The second moon had not only altered the trajectory of a small town, it had also redefined my own path, intertwining my fate with the stars. In the end, the second moon reminded us all that the universe is vast and full of wonders waiting to be discovered, if only we are bold enough to look up and question what we see. As for me, the sky was no longer a limit but a vast canvas, ripe with the hues of infinite possibilities.